Um, okay, recording in progress. <laughs> it's always an honor and privilege to work with the people who continue to find the time and the space to share their skills and knowledge with us. Our group of producers of the A to Z Impacts Educational Webinar, webinar Series, Mary, Peggy, Alyssa, Cheryl, Kelsey, Kelly, Ryan, and some of our newest members, Emily, Jason, and Josephine. And of course, we'd like to thank CL for the funding to do this program. And especially, I wanna thank our panel of experts tonight who are also grassroots frontline community folks, all of them leaders in their own right. So before I do the land acknowledgement, I'm going to pass this off to um, uh, the person, which I'm not sure who that is, I apologize, who's going to do a little bit of housekeeping and tell you what's going to happen during the webinar and after. Take it away, and then I'll do the land acknowledgement. Well, I think I'll do that. All um, right. What we will be doing is very simply going through 15 minute presentations. And what we will want you to do is put the questions in the chat. Um, we are not live screaming, uh, screaming. We are not live streaming tonight. Um, however, we will put that up onto the website as soon as possible afterwards. Um, we are going to hold all questions until the end of the program. And then we will um, have our panel of, of what I feel are experts discuss what we need to do going forward with um, our health, because your health matters and we need to do what we can to stay healthy in this environment of what I call toxic soup. So um, put your questions in, we will address them. And uh, afterwards, we will send you uh, pre the presentations for your uh, uh, later use. Okay, back to Brenda. Thank you very much, Peggy, and I apologize to everyone tonight. It's been a little bit of a crazy few weeks, but uh, we're all here, and we're all friends and people, and so let's get going. So tonight, for the land acknowledgement, as a matter of formality and protocol, we recognize that the lands we occupied were once the home of many different peoples, tribes, clans, and communities. And we ask everyone here to honor them, take up what they taught us, learn what they taught us, how they lived, how they honored their commitments and knowledge. And just remember that all the gifts of creation are not to be exploited. It's another thing they taught us. Our ancestors recognized and celebrated the seasons and the gifts of those seasons. They planned and carried out the ways in which to not only survive a season or two, but to ensure there would be many more seasons and generations to come. They learned and grew in their knowledge. They learned from their mistakes and their successes. But what, what are we doing now? As a society, as a people, are we learning and growing? Or are we allowing a select few to destroy, poison, control, waste, and essentially doom future generations? It took billions of years to create a world where millions of life forms evolved and thrived. It took billions of years of violent changes, layers upon layers of life that created the hydrocarbons that we're now extracting and burning. And during those billions of years, the aquifers, lakes, streams, rivers formed, filtered the rains, snow and ice melts and stored them deep within the earth. The water was so pure, filled with minerals and nutrients that all life must have to thrive. And we still have some of that. But as we know, our rivers, our lakes, our streams are becoming what Peggy just said, kind of a toxic soup. So it's taken just a few short centuries for humankind to exploit and manipulate those hydrocarbons into deadly chemicals, substances that we use to manip manipulate nature. It serves selfish and unreasonable demands. Take we take dangerous shortcuts and eliminate what we don't understand or to satisfy our greed because of collective hubris and misguided egos. But it's our home now. 
and our responsibility to care for and protect what's left of all these precious resources, the very basics though, air, water, and our land. You know, I keep asking why we're allowing the use of these poisons, these volatile organic pollutants or persistent organic pollutants to be dumped into our rivers, our streams, our lakes. What makes it right for any volume of pollutants to be admitted into the air in any quantities? And why do we trust the foods that are covered in dangerous chemicals to feed us, to feed our children? Why is it all this violence to the land and our relatives excess acceptable? Why aren't we demanding accountability and repair and restitution from those who keep doing these things, forcing all, on, all of this on us for profits? We have to keep asking these questions. Our demands must be heard and needed. We need to, we need um, to say things like, and to remember to go back to the future, to find the ways, remember the ways that just a few short decades ago that plastic and disposable single use was, was really pretty much unheard of. We got along just fine too. We grew gardens, traded skills and goods, we repaired and reused, we spent time creating, we adapted to the challenges. Of course, it wasn't all you know, unicorns and rainbows, but what we have now, the price of failure, it will be catastrophic. We need to put on our big kid moccasins and we need to get to work solving the real problems, identify the lies and misdirections that we're fed pretty much <laughs> 24 seven, and we can't do it alone. So here we are doing what we're able to do to encourage and empower everyone here now and whoever watches this later. I'm always humbled and honored to be here with our speakers. So I hope you'll sit back, relax, take what you hear tonight and share it with family and friends. Just talk to each other, find some, find the common ground that we need. Tonight, we're gonna learn facts and details and data that you can trust. We can use it to push back, demand accountability and change what will serve all of us. So I am going to take it to our speakers. I'll give, I'll provide a little introduction for each one of them. And as the speakers begin their presentations and their introductions, they also provided us some links that they want you to look into. Um, so I'll be putting those in the chat and we'll be copying the chat and that'll be part of the information that we provide after this presentation. So I want to thank you again. I hope all of you are well, remain well and safe. So I am my first speaker um, is actually a friend. We've done a lot of talking in the past, probably not as much as we'd like to presently, but you know, we're all busy. Her name is Randy Polk. I always mess this up. I'm sorry, Randy. Paul Donick was born and raised in the Ohio Valley. She earned an associate degree in environmental engineering and a BA in chemistry and an MA and PhD in environmental studies. She is certified in hazardous materials, regulations, and has a teaching license in science and math. She worked as a research chemist for 11 years at National Steels Research Center in Weirton, West Virginia. She has taught both secondary and post-secondary science courses. She now volunteers for several environmental nonprofits in the Ohio Valley, including the Mid-Ohio Valley Climate Action and Concerned Ohio River Residents. She received several awards, including Eastern Gateway Community College's Outstanding Alumnus of 2018, Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition's Community Network of the Year for 2015, Fractivist of the Year in 2018, and in 2020, the Laura Foreman Passion for Justice Award. She was nominated for a Community Sentinel Award in 2019 for her efforts to educate the public on the hazard of plastic cracker facilities. Her research includes examining the threats to non-timber forest products in Appalachia. She also is focused on climate change and how forests can be used to mitigate carbon emissions. She resides with her husband at Tappan Lake in an echo log home that they built together using sustainable building and design practices. She enjoys hiking, biking, and making wine with her husband. It is my pleasure and my honor to in introduce Randy to you now.
You're on mute, Randy. Randy, Randy, you're on mute. Okay, can everybody see that now? Yes. See Ian here. Okay, great. I'm not a technology literate person per se. Okay, I'm trying to get this to advance here. Okay, I'm having I, my slides won't advance. Any any uh, suggestions on that? Try stop sharing and resharing. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, this slide kind of shows what the problem's been. For years, we have been increasing the amount of plastics that we make. I was born in 1955, so you can see the bottom on the X scale, how very little amount of plastics were made. And now you can see on the opposite side, how it's just skyrocketed. And I'd just like to point out that um, most of these plastics or a good percentage of these plastics are for single use applications. So they wrap up a sandwich or they wrap up a banana on a piece of styrofoam and immediately they get thrown away once they come to your home. So this isn't something like a Tupperware container. And I do have Tupperware containers for my um, flour and sugar and I've had them for 55 years. And that just shows you how long they'll last. And they were handed down to me too from my mom. All right, so from the very beginning of uh, natural gas production at the wellhead to the end where we make plastics in the cracker plants, there are environmental problems all along that route, that production line. Some of the things that happen in between the wellhead and the cracker plant itself are fugitive emissions. So when the gas is placed inside of pipelines or compressor stations, they've gone out in the field and they've had blur cameras, which are uh, infrared cameras, and they can detect all of these volatile organic substances that you couldn't see with the naked eye. And they found that a lot of places, these are just leaking horrendously into the atmosphere. And sometimes these facilities, unfortunately, are located next to schools, uh, next to um, rest homes and other places where people are going to be exposed to these kinds of gases. But if you look at the well pad itself, and this is a, a drawing or a photograph of a well pad, there are so many different environmental issues and health issues and just at this pad alone. For one is the amount of chemicals that are stored on site that they use to make the frac fluid. Another is the fact that once they start to drill, there are volatile materials that come up fracking sand, which in communities where they mine the sand, there are high levels of, of um, silicosis. And they're also using uh, chemicals that for, for most of the people in the area, they are unknown. People do not sit for safety or endocrine disruption. So it's, it's really a guessing game for the people and the workers that are exposed at these wellheads as to what actually they're being exposed to. And we know that a lot of them are carcinogens and mutagens. So once they, they frack the well and they start to bring the material up, uh, then you've got the issue of the contaminated uh, brine. And this brine is being trucked all along roads. I, I was walking today before um, this, this presentation and I saw two brine trucks just traveling on the road that's in front of our house. And these brine trucks are carrying all this produced water. No one knows for sure exactly what's in the water, but they do know from previous testing that they contain radioactive materials. Of course, they contain all the fracking chemicals that they use uh, to shoot down into the, the drilling well. And they contain some of the sand that comes up. So this produced water is just treated like brine. And even though it does have salts in it, which are in dangerous levels and things like bromine, it really isn't just salt water. It's so much more than that. And in the state of Ohio, they're spreading this on roads as a, a de-icing agent and a, and a dust preventative. So it's, it's really um, ridiculous the amount of exposure because you can think of all the different roads and the, and the um, you know, rural areas that are being sprayed with this kind of material. Okay, this is just a slide that shows you all the different places along that supply chain from the well pad to your house where you can get exposed 
to some, to some of these uh, volatile organic compounds. And benzene is, is really the big one, toluene, uh, xylene. These are some of the known carcinogens that you could be exposed to. And then something that a lot of people don't realize is that when they start to frack, because they fracture the bedrock underneath of the area, they are allowing radon gas to seep up through those fissures. And a lot of times in areas where they have frack, they notice if they do radon testing in the homes, these levels have skyrocketed. We had this happen to our house. Uh, when we first built our house, thankfully, we put in a radon detection system. And then once they started to frack, we did a test. We didn't have the system hooked up, but we found out that our radon level was 110. And that is absolutely ridiculous, picocuries per liter of air. So we had to put our system in and get a pump. So we were happy that we thought ahead of time to do that. But most people don't realize this. And in addition, if you have a gas stove or a gas furnace, anything that's in that natural gas supply is not really natural. It is in the, the, the um, below the surface of the planet, but for sure it's got other toxic substances in it, in addition to the radon. And they're doing studies on this right now to, to try to warn people about what's going on with uh, homes that are supplied with natural gas. This is a, a dense disposal injection. Well, this is uh, three miles down the road from, from where my family lives. And this is just one of the many sites in Southeast Ohio where they do injection of the produced water. And they store it in these large containers and then eventually inject it into the ground. And there's been so much controversy about where these places are located. For sure, it's an environmental justice issue. Uh, they're usually in poor communities and rural settings. And in some cases, when they don't want to inject the water, in addition to spraying it, using it as a de-icer and a, um, a dust preventative, sometimes we see them just dumping it in streams, uh, you know, in the rural areas. My husband used to work for the Corps of Engineers at their pumps, and they were just pumping it straight into a stream. Okay, this would be the end result of, of all those different supply areas that we saw in the beginning slide. This is the cracker plant. It's much further along than this slide because it's 2022 now. This was in 2019. And we've heard through the grapevine that it's supposed to open in early spring next year. But this is an enormous facility. I've driven by it a few times when it was in the earlier stages of construction. But this is where the, the, the neurals that they use to make plastic, they will be made here. And they have an air pollution permit and a, an IPDES permit for a, a water pollution. But just because you have a permit does not mean the facility is safe. A permit just means you filled out your paperwork and uh, they rubber stamped it as the EPA often does or the Department of Environmental Protection. And they just pretty much let them go online regardless of what health effects might happen to the surrounding communities. Okay, the problem with these compounds is that they are alike as far as structure, molecular structure. So these are just two samples of plasticizers. And they've linked these plasticizers to breast cancer, prostate, testicular cancer, obesity, infertility, endometriosis, and early onset, puberty, miscarriages, and diabetes. And there are other health effects from these, but these are just a few of them. And you can see how they look a lot like naturally occurring compounds in the body. So I'll just go back and forth. They have that similar benzene ring structure. Okay, so what happens when the body sees these chemicals? is that they're not sure if these are naturally occurring hormones or, or these toxic chemicals. So there's a simple model to explain. It's the lock and key model. So uh, several things can happen, but, but two of the most common things that can happen is these chemicals can get into the, the places on your body that receive the hormones naturally, and they can either block the normal function that's turned on, or they can turn on a different function. So they can act like synthetic estrogen. All right, so some of the ways that plastics uh, introduce toxins into our bodies. Well, the plastic themselves introduce toxins because all plastics have some kind of a um, polymer uh, structure to them. And it just depends on if it's high density polyethylene or if it's um, a, um, I'm trying to think of one here, xylene, which is, or I'm sorry, styrene, which is a benzene polymer. But they have, in many cases, shown that there is unreacted monomer or polymers on the plastics themselves. So in other words, there's a little leftover material from making that plastic on that plastic um, food container. And when you put your food inside that container, you're, you're getting um, some of that monomer or polymer into the food itself. Or if you have a bid, 
put the container in a microwave with plastic and the food inside of it, you're actually breaking that plastic down enough so that some of that polymer is getting inside of your food. Okay, another problem with plastics is they don't break down as far as like uh, compost pile would break down, but they do break physically into tiny pieces and they become microplastics and nanoplastics. When these are exposed to other toxins in our environment, for instance, if a plastic bottle were floating around in Lake Erie, they can absorb some of those carbon-based uh, dangerous compounds at, like little sponges. And then once they do, if we ingest these microplastics or nanoplastics, we are also getting some of that compound in our body. And, and this has happened a lot because they found plastics even in human feces in our bloodstreams, it crosses the placenta, so they know it's there. And then the plastic additives themselves, there's, there's a really good article and I'll try to um, send it, I don't know if I can send it in a link right now, but it's in the Journal of Hazardous Material. And it is a peer reviewed study of the different kinds of plastic additives, anything from flame retardants to bisphenol A that was added years ago to make plastics uh, uh, pliable, like in the binky that babies would suck on and they, they found that the bisphenol A was getting into their bodies from sucking on that binky. But there's so many different additives, heavy metals are additives, and they're put in the plastics for various reasons to make them rigid or to make them softer, to color them. To make them resistant to UV light, but for whatever reasons, these are not chemicals we really want in our bodies, these plastic additives. Some of the health effects I've discussed before is demasculinizing males and calming, causing premature menses. They know now by studies from gynecologists that uh, girls start their periods earlier and earlier, and there's uh, even cases where girls as young as six years old are starting their period because they're just drowning in the sea estrogen from the plastics. They know sperm counts drop. We're, we're half, as far as sperm counts, more than half of what our grandfathers were. And people in, in infertility clinics are not uh, just people in their late 30s. They're young people that are having trouble getting pregnant. These uh, plastics and plasticizers can cause obesity. And think of it this way. If you had a, um, a glass of Kool-Aid and you dump too much sugar in, well, because the sugar is soluble, you can't really get the sugar out of the Kool-Aid. So the only way you can dilute that sugar is to add more water to that, that glass of Kool-Aid. Well, this is what happens in the body. A lot of these compounds, because they're fat soluble, they dissolve in our fat supply. Our body realizes there's a toxin there. It can't really get rid of it. So instead it makes more fat cells and causes obesity. There are of course carcinogens, mutagens, and endocrine disruptors, and they can cause neurological problems and negatively impact the immune system. And this is one of the things that people were studying during the COVID outbreak when it first started was how does exposure to some of these compounds affect people's ability to fight off things like COVID. This is a sad uh, situation. This is a First Nation tribe that's located uh, north of Detroit and it's in an area of Canada which is just uh, polluted with petrochemical industries and other uh, types of facilities that cause a lot of emissions of petrochemicals. And they found through the last 20 years that the birth rates, when they do a study of uh, girls to boys, there's uh, seven to three. So for every seven girls, there's three boys born. So there, there are not the, the amount of baby boys, usually it's 50-50, being born in this region because they're being exposed, they think, to so many of these uh, demasculinizing compounds. This is, uh, on the left side, this is what our grandparents' pantries used to look like. And then this is what our kitchens or our storage areas where we put our food are, are looking like now. And it's sad because you really, it's hard to avoid plastics. I mean, everyone goes grocery shopping, you know, it's almost impossible to go into an area and say, I don't want plastics because everything is in plastics. And, and I know most of it's for convenience and some of it's for food safety, but it's, it's, it's got to stop because we just were just drowning ourselves in plastics. And this is what's happening. I mean, it's hard to find the beach anywhere where you can't find nurdles, the tiny precursors to plastic uh, glasses and cups and, and uh, trays. And then you find water bottles everywhere. And Coca-Cola is, is the big one when it comes to polluting as far as uh, the plastic Coke bottles. Two minutes so left, you, Randy. Thank you. So what can you do to lower your plastic intake? Well, you can reduce single-use plastics. Uh, use silicon wraps or canning jars for your food. And I, I do this all the time. Um, we use drops laundry detergent. And it looks like little tiny 
bags, but it's made out of a, an alcohol base, so it dissolves in the water. But there are other types of laundry detergent, so you don't have to buy that big jug. Uh, Boyd, uh, the Keurig coffee makers with all the Keurig cups. I have a, a stainless steel percolator. I don't want my coffee going through plastic. Of course, avoid processed foods because it's all prepackaged and it's in plastic. And then write letters to the editor, legislators, uh, write to your grocery store manager. I have uh, little tiny slips of paper that talks about all the dangers of plastic. And I just leave them on top of the areas in the grocery store where there's a lot of plastic. And somebody finds them. Maybe it's a consumer, maybe it's the manager. Thank you for listening, and I'll, I'll take any questions after everyone's done with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randy. I got, I got to tell you, the wealth of information that she has, and she really works at it. I mean, there's a lot of different events and places that she goes to teach all this, and it's we just can't thank you enough, Randy. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So our next speaker, I guess I should, I didn't even introduce myself, but I'll do it in the chat. Uh, basically, I do this because I live here. My family lives here. And, you know, we all got to step it up, I guess, as much as we can. So our next speaker is Ned Ketyer. He's a Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area pediatrician. He served his community for 26 years in private practice before retiring from patient care in 2017, although he continues to write a daily blog for an AHN pediatrics um, blog called Pedia Blog, and I will put that link in the chat here in just a minute. He remains a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Environmental Health and Climate Change and is the president of Physicians for Social Responsibility Pennsylvania. Dr. Katyer is a medical advisor for the Environmental Health Project, bringing attention to the health impacts of fracking in the Marcellus Shale gas patch. He is also a co-chair of the Education and Outreach Working Group for the Cancer and Environmental Network of Southwestern Pennsylvania. Dr. Katyer's work connects the rapid expansion of shale gas extraction, fracking, and petrochemical plastic development in the Ohio River Valley with the local and regional health impacts currently experienced by residents and the global ecologic and public health catastrophes resulting from plastic pollution and climate change that threaten the health and well being of all passengers on the shiny blue or big blue ball. Thank you very much. Take it away, Dr. Ketyer. Thank you, BJ. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, it looks good, Ned. Okay, very good. Okay, so whether it comes from upstream, downstream, or in between, we know from decades of research that fossil fuel pollution damages our health, as Randy said, from cradle to grave. Uh, we know that the tiny particles and the smelly vapors uh, and chemicals produced in the extraction and burning of fossil fuels can impair fertility, complicate pregnancies, and lead to poor birth outcomes. Birth defects and developmental delays lead to lifelong health burdens for young children, for their families, and for society. Uh, every uh, lung cancer, uh, bladder cancer, and other types of adult and childhood cancers are linked to fossil fuel pollution, which impacts practically every organ in the body, not just the lungs, but also the heart and the brain, the liver and the kidneys. Uh, recent research describes the links between air pollution and the development of obesity, type 2 diabetes, dementia, anxiety, depression, and other forms of mental illness. Uh, and it's now estimated that nearly 9 million people worldwide die prematurely each year as a result of fossil fueled air pollution. And that includes hundreds of thousands of Americans. Bear with me for one second while I try to figure out why this isn't going to the next one. There we go. Uh, every cracker plant emits these air toxics in large quantities 24-7. Uh, and the shell cracker plant is no different. With all the fracking and cracking going on here, it's easy to see why medical providers and local residents are worried that southwestern Pennsylvania will soon become America's next cancer alley. It's important to note that the chemicals released from the cracker plant will mostly be invisible, 
but it will be enough to make people living and working nearby sick. And I want to point out the 2.2 megatons of carbon dioxide and CO2 equivalents each year. Enough greenhouse gases, gases to help accelerate global climate change that is impacting everybody on the planet. Shell's inhalation risk assessment was submitted to the Department of Environmental Protection in 2015, and it identified 53 chemicals of concern that will be produced at the petrochemical complex in Beaver County. All of them, including the many carcinogens that are listed, are dangerous if workers and residents are exposed to them. And no one should be surprised that people who live near cracker plants tend to get sick. That's just what happens. And the shell cracker is no different. The acute health effects from this sort of air pollution are predictable. Mild exposures to some of these air toxics can bring eye, nose, and throat irritation to some people. Moderate exposures can lead to additional symptoms like headaches, uh, which can be debilitating for some people. In the event of an accident or during a temperature inversion, uh, that traps pollution in the river valley. And we get a lot of those in Southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, higher exposures might result in more severe symptoms such as shortness of breath, chest pain, palpitations, changes in heart rate and blood pressure. And then you have the extreme exposures that can lead to impaired cognition, difficulty uh, concentrating and confusion. Uh, looking upstream, we know how damaging fracking is to human health and the environment and to the planet's climate system. Uh, the Fracking Science Compendium is now in its eighth edition, and it contains more than 2,200 scientific and medical studies, government reports, and media investigations showing no evidence that fracking can be practiced in a manner that does not threaten human health directly or without imperiling climate stability upon which human health depends. Fracking has never operated safely anywhere, and it can't operate safely here. Now, here are the most common air toxics uh, produced during fracking operations. Some are the same as the cracker plant emissions that we looked at earlier. Uh, breathing fine and ultrafine particulate matter can cause heart and respiratory problems, cancer and chronic inflammatory disorders. Volatile organic compounds or VOCs can damage organs and cause cancer. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs are linked to endocrine disruption, immune dysfunction, and cancer. Fracking chemicals can become aerosolized and can cause illness and disease. And silica dust causes silicosis, chronic lung disease, and lung cancer. Heavy metals like lead, arsenic, and mercury are especially toxic to young children. Then there are those T norms, the technologically enhanced, naturally occurring radioactive materials that are so concerning in all the fracking waste that's generated. Carbon monoxide is toxic to every human. Nitrogen oxides are respiratory tract irritants and precursors of uh, ground level ozone, which affects every person's lung function. And greenhouse gases, the carbon dioxide and methane. Again, with the exception of silica dust, all of these air toxics are invisible. People who live near fracked gas operations report many different adverse health symptoms. Uh, one study from the Environmental Health Project lists uh, the top 10 symptoms reported by people living within one kilometer of shale gas activity in Pennsylvania. Sleep disruption is often the result of nonstop truck activity, noise, odors, and light, while a well is being drilled and fracked. Headaches and throat irritation are also widely reported, and stress and anxiety are side effects of living near fracking sites. There was coughing and wheezing and shortness of breath, sinus problems, fatigue, and nausea. I've experienced uh, a lot of these symptoms myself traveling around Washington County and visiting people living near fracking infrastructure whose health has been negatively impacted. Now, some of these symptoms look like nuisance complaints, but when people are exposed to fracking activities and pollution day in and day out for months and even years at a time, these acute symptoms of exposure and stress often become chronic uh, medical problems. Uh, multiple studies, many of which were conducted here in Pennsylvania, now show that living near fracking sites can complicate pregnancies and lead to poor birth outcomes like prematurity, low birth weight, small for gestational age newborns, and birth defects, each one having lifelong consequences for children 
and their parents. Now, one type of chemical affecting fetal and infant growth and development is PFAS, which has been used in fracking operations across the country for many years. Uh, and maybe you've been reading about it, I'm sure you have. Um, everyone's talking about PFAS, which stands for per or polyfluoroalkyl substances. They're also known as forever chemicals because their chemical structures are incredibly stable and they don't break down over time. Instead, they persist in the environment and bioaccumulate in all life forms, including us. PFAS chemicals are popular because of their water repellent, stain and grease repellent, and resistant and heat resistant properties. Last summer, uh, a study from Dusty Horwitt at PSR revealed for the first time that since 2012, PFAS chemicals and their precursors were used in at least 1,200 fracked oil and gas wells in six states, uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, uh, Oklahoma, Texas, and Wyoming. In January, PSR published another study that found that PFAS chemicals or precursors were used in more than 12,000 oil and gas wells in Colorado since at least uh, 2008, and probably much longer than that. And just last month, Dusty and PSR reported that PFAS chemicals were used in more than 100 oil and gas wells in Ohio. The number is probably much higher, Dusty said, because the industry is allowed to hide the identities of the chemicals uh, that are used um, as trade secrets. Well, what about Pennsylvania, the second largest gas producer in the nation? The Philadelphia Inquirer did its own investigation investigation last year and found that PFAS chemicals were used in at least eight Pennsylvania wells. Uh, the editorial board wrote, our findings should raise concerns for all Pennsylvanians. Uh, we're hoping that PSR will publish a separate report on Pennsylvania's PFAS situation, but nobody should be surprised if we find out that PFAS has been used widely here. And no one should be surprised when we learn that PFAS is making us sick. As you can see on this slide, PFAS is a systemic toxicant affecting multiple organs and body systems. It can directly damage major organs like the liver. It's oncogenic and is strongly associated with the development of testicular cancer in men and kidney cancer. Uh, and I'll pause to say that I am a survivor of kidney cancer. Uh, there is some evidence showing a link to breast cancer. It can act as an endocrine disrupting chemical at extremely low concentrations, causing hormone dysfunction, obesity, and thyroid disease, increasing blood cholesterol levels, which can lead to coronary heart disease. And PFAS can have an adverse impact on fetal and infant growth and development. Studies have highlighted concerns of possible impacts on human reproduction. And there's, a good, there's good evidence showing that PFAS chemicals interfere with childhood responses to vaccines. Because there are no federal regulations limiting their use in industrial processes and consumer products, PFAS has become ubiquitous in the food, air, and water, and in us. Uh, this is why discovering a new source of contamination from fracking is so alarming. And now we have multiple studies linking fracking uh, to other medical problems, including cancer in children. Uh, in 2017, researchers at Yale University School of Public Health identified 55 chemicals used in fracking that are known, probable, or possible carcinogens. 20 of those chemicals are known to increase the risk of leukemia and other blood cancers specifically. Five years later, the same research team conducted a study in Pennsylvania and released the jaw-dropping results in August. What they found is that young children living within two kilometers or about a mile and a quarter of an unconventional gas well while their mothers were pregnant had two to three times the risk of developing acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a rare cancer, but still one of the more common cancers in children. In fact, the risk was higher in young kids living up to 10 kilometers or about six miles uh, from a fracked gas well compared to kids who didn't live near a gas well. Uh, now, as you know, we already have a childhood cancer crisis here in Pennsylvania from 2008 to 2018 in four heavily fracked counties in southwestern Pennsylvania. Two reporters at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette uncovered 27 cases of Ewing sarcoma, 
which is a very rare and frequently fatal bone cancer in childhood. And they also found 40 cases of other rare cancers, including leukemia, for a total of 67 rare cancers in children, teenagers, and young adults. Now, only about 200 cases of Ewing sarcoma are diagnosed in the United States each year. In Washington County, which is Pennsylvania's most heavily fracked county, and that's where I'm from, six cases of Ewing sarcoma and 30 other rare childhood cancers were counted. Uh, uh, these numbers are far more than would be expected to occur in a similarly populated, mostly rural area over a 10 year period. And new cases keep popping up in this region. Parents and physicians like me are concerned that pollution and toxic waste from fracking operations may be to blame for this outbreak of rare childhood cancers. Six months after Templeton and Hopi uh, published the human toll, I had the chance to go to the state house along with dozens of concerned community members. And we spoke with Governor Wolf and other lawmakers and demanded a thorough and transparent investigation into the causes of these rare pediatric cancers. And four days later, Governor Wolf announced the creation of two studies, which are currently being conducted by the Pennsylvania Department of Health and the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health. One study is examining health impacts in heavily fracked counties in southwestern Pennsylvania, specifically birth outcomes and asthma, and the other on the plausible link between fracking and those rare childhood cancers. Uh, you may have uh, seen in the news last week that the University of Pittsburgh and the DOH abruptly pulled out of their commitment to attend a public meeting uh, with concerned community members, a meeting that they themselves helped plan, uh, clearly updating residents on the study's progress was just too much for the industry and industry-friendly politicians to take, and pressure was applied to the university and the DOH to pull out. However, the event did take place last Wednesday and was very well attended. Residents were engaged during the presentations and panel discussion, and they asked great questions. Industry's sloppy attempt to gain control of the narrative failed. And the narrative is unfavorable to the industry and its enablers. The leukemia study, for example, like most epidemiologic studies, is not designed to establish causation. Rather, it simply adds to the growing mountain of evidence showing associations between fracking and harm. Uh, but there are things with, that we already know about fracking, and we know them beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, most of the accumulated evidence, and there's a lot of it, objectively demonstrates that fracking is inherently dirty and dangerous and industry rules and government regulations aren't gonna fix it. And we know beyond a reasonable doubt that fracking scars the landscape and degrades the environment that humans and all life forms depend on. And we know beyond a reasonable doubt that fracking pollutes the air, the water and the soil that we all share. And it endangers wildlife and aquatic life by destroying and poisoning habitats and threatens the health of farm animals and pets. Beyond a reasonable doubt, we know it exacerbates plastic pollution, that global ecological disaster, uh, and it worsens the cumulative health impact of petrochemicals present in the environment and in our consumer products. And we know, again, beyond a reasonable doubt, that fracking accelerates climate change and threatens the future of our children. And finally, as you've seen here tonight, we know beyond a reasonable doubt that fracking and cracking makes people sick. So thank you uh, for listening. Uh, I'm looking forward to answering some of your questions at the end of this, uh, these talks. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I, I read some industry publications and um, they're, they're just, it's just egregious how they talk about this and you know just it's all about jobs and and development and so yeah thank you so very much it's it's frightening but we do need to know this information so um yeah we'll have i'm sure we'll have questions afterward again thank you so next we are going to welcome bailey Bailey Fulwaller is an MSSA LSW, a licensed community social worker and independent ecological grief consultant. 
Bailey receives her master's degree in social administration for community change from Case Western Reserve University, where she studied ecolog ecological grief at the intersection of mental health and climate change. As a consultant, she works with environmental groups and organizations to navigate echo anxiety, ecological grief, and burnout through strategic planning, collective care initiatives, and education. She also serves as a statewide med mental health first aid program manager with Mental Health America of Ohio, connecting organizations and communities to mental health education. In addition, Bell Bailey is a trauma responsive 200 registered yoga teacher who honors her training and experiences by sharing the methods and practices of yoga for resilience in several halfway houses throughout central Ohio. Thank you very much for being here, Bailey. Please present your, um, your information. And don't Hi. unmute. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of your um, afternoon. I want to start by taking a moment to acknowledge that we just got a lot of information that there's both a lot of plastic and more plastic coming in our planet. My elk hound just woke up. You'll hear some pitter pattering in the background. Um, and also that this plastic that's accumulating has a lot of very serious and really unnerving um, outputs and side effects. So I wanna ask an invitation that you're welcome to accept or decline, but if you wanna get curious, bring to mind a sound in nature that brings you peace or ease or joy. Maybe running water, or the sound of wind moving through leaves. If you're somewhere where the leaves are falling, maybe stepping on the crunchy leaves. The insects that sing you to bed at night, the birds that wake you up in the morning. And notice if bringing to mind any of those sounds changed your mood, your attitude, or your outlook from our previous conversations. And if it did, that is the beautiful, powerful human nature connection that is so pivotal to us. We benefit so greatly from our connection with nature and when it's damaged or harmed and negatively impacts our mental wellness in addition to our physical wellness. So I just wanted to start today with remembering some of the good as we move through some of the challenges. If you wanna to move to the next slide, so we know that the extraction and transportation of fossil fuels impacts our brain development. Um, in doing those processes, we release over 170 known um, chemicals that harm our brain um, and result in neurological damage that can result in lowered cognition, difficulty processing and expressing emotions and other harms in our brain. So you are a social creature as a human mammal um, and not being able to clearly think, um, form thoughts and process and express your emotions are gonna have a huge impact on how you connect with the world, how you connect with yourself and your mental well-being as a member of a social species. When we're refining and manufacturing fossil fuels, we release cancer causing and other toxic chemicals that can impair our nervous system. That's our fight and flight. Um, in addition to a, a ton of other beautiful things that our nervous system does to keep us safe and this can also result in delays or damage to brain development, particularly for youth and older adults. So those young people in our lives and our elders are particularly vulnerable um, and their, their negative impacts impact us as members of families, communities, and workplaces. Um, this can present as bizarre or irrational behavior, rapid mood swings, increased aggression and difficulty accessing the prefrontal cortex, which helps us in decision-making. So when we're looking at studies of folks that live really close to Superfund sites and other highly polluted areas, a lot of times we see the symptoms of mental illness without a mental health condition. And this is often linked um, or correlated with that pollution um, resulting in brain damages that change the ways that we interact with each other and ourselves. Next slide. 
Um, when we're talking about brain function, so neurological damage is a big word that might not mean anything to you know you moving through everyday life. We know that studies of plastic pollutions impact the brain um, largely have been done in non-human species, but as Ned and Regina shared, we're getting more and more information on how it impacts humans as well. Um, and studies that look at fish and marine life, um, we see that the plastics that we're absorbing through our water, for, through our food and through our air, impact and impair our communication between nerve cells of the brain. So that means our brain isn't able to communicate as well with other parts of the body, which means we might have delayed reaction to things or difficulty processing external stimuli. Uh, this has also resulted in dysfunctional behavior that impacts the ways that different species feed, move, reproduce, and survive. Um, I don't know about you, but I love to eat. I love to move. I'm excited when my loved ones bring new little people into the world, and I really want everyone in my life to survive. So those are some pretty negative impacts that we're seeing in studies for other species. And we're getting more and more information that that is mirrored and similar in humans. Uh, this has also resulted again in dysfunctional behavior that, in, oh, I just repeated myself, ignore me. Um, and then moving on to what Ned was speaking about, the impact of chronic illness. Chronic illness is one of the number one uh, risk factors for mental health conditions. We know that navigating chronic pain, particularly in a country where we don't have consistent and equitable healthcare access and not all folks feel safe or have the financial means to access healthcare is a huge burden on individuals, families, and loved ones. Um, and so those symptoms of migraines, miscarriages, developmental displays, uh, asthma, COPD, cancers, and other harms that we experience in our body are really going to negatively impact our mental well-being and can put us at greater risk for experiencing um, conditions like anxiety, depression, and other really hard conditions that make it even more challenging to navigate our physical health concerns. Next slide. So something we don't always talk about are the social factors of plastic and pollutants. Um, again, we're a social species, so our social health is imperative to our well-being. We know that people who feel lonely or have decreased social well-being are more at risk to have both mental health and physical health negative outcomes. So community members that reside in highly polluted areas are shown in research to have less social capital. So that means they have less social connections and ability to accomplish what they need or access care and services when they want it. Um, they experience lower levels of social connection to neighbors. Um, anyone that just was through COVID knows the value of neighbors and how important it is to look after our community members. So in those highly polluted areas, we're seeing less connection to neighbors, um, largely due to less access to outdoor recreation, um, less connection to place and land, um, feeling connected to a community, to a place, and to a space are amazing for our mental health. They help us feel secure. They help us make relationships. They help guide who we are as a person. When we don't feel connected to place and land, that's gonna negatively impact our ability to interact with the world and to build a strong foundation and community. Uh, we also know that some of the social factors are experiencing economic hardships like lack of employment opportunities and lower housing values. Areas with polluting parties are less likely to have big employers come in and to have new job opportunities offered. We also know that there can be job discrimination in which particular zip codes or areas in applying are less likely to get hired due to knowing that an area is less desirable um, environmentally. Um, and then we also know that if we're trying to buy or sell a house, if our house value is decreased by polluting parties, that's going to negatively impact our ability to move. Um, and not being able to have options or agency over where we live negatively impacts our mental health. So social, economic, and mental well-being are all interrelated. Just like all the systems in nature are connected, if one of those areas of well-being is harmed, it's gonna negatively impact the other areas of well-being. And we know that if we foster one of those areas of well-being, then we can boost up the other ones as well. So when social and economic health suffers, it puts both the individual and the community at greater risk for decreased mental well-being. So if we can uh, tackle one of those, then we're going to have a positive impact on the others. Next slide. 
environmental factors. And so typically when we hear environmental factors, we're thinking about, you know, in the um, this context, those more specific things. I'm talking about your landscape. So what does your community look like, feel like? What do you see when you're walking down the street? So in communities with high levels, levels of litter, air, um, poor air quality in the present of polluting parties, we see that um, there's decreased community um, self-esteem. So both individuals and community organizations report feeling less esteem and confidence in their community. That's gonna impact how you engage with the world, what opportunities you see, and how other organizations and communities view you. We also see decreased levels of trust between neighbors, um, which leads to greater levels of conflict, decreased levels of outdoor recreation, and decreased levels of food production and gardening. So if you're living in an area that's highly polluted, whether that's with litter, whether that's the air quality, or whether that's the presence of a polluting party that has those invisible um, negative impacts, that's going to change the way that you feel about yourself and your community. It's going to make it harder to form social relationships, whether that's the neurological or the external component. We're gonna have decreased levels of time outside. We know that there are numerous mental health and physical health benefits from time moving our bodies outside and being with others outside. So if you don't feel safe or comfortable or able to enjoy those activities, um, you're going to see decreased mental health. We see this in schools that are closed due to um, high levels of heat and not having air conditioning. We also see this in schools where school districts where children have high levels of asthma and aren't participating in sports or aren't participating in outdoor recreation with their other students. Um, an increased conflict can be due in part due to those bizarre um, behaviors and higher levels of aggression that we sometimes see with the neurological damage, but it can also be um, through that lack of connection with your space and the lack of knowing and trusting your neighbors. So just like Ned said, this is not causation, this is correlation. So it's measuring the amount of damage to the landscape and the damage to individuals and communities. Um, and it's deeply tied with factors like racial and economic justice when we look at what communities do we have um, polluting parties in. Next slide, please. So there are a couple of different terms for mental health conditions that researchers are exploring um, in relation to climate change and climate injustice. One is called solastesia, um, which is the sister of nostalgia. And this is the pain experience when there's a recognition that the place where one resides and that one loves is under immediate assault, um, or more poetically put, a form of homesickness one gets when one is still at home. If you've ever been a camp counselor or gone to camp or gone to college and lived on campus, you know homesickness is real. It hits, it's hard, um, it's a huge shared experience that we have. So with solastalgia, um, the communities that we've studied the most in the United States are communities that have experienced mountaintop removal um, and the feeling of looking out at a landscape and seeing that it's been damaged and then emotional pain as a result from that. And so um, ways to think about solastalgia is if you can bring to mind a place that you love or you feel like is home to you, that you've seen damaged by climate change or polluting parties, um, what emotions or feelings come up for you? Um, and so I think most people have a good experience of this now with how wide scale climate injustice is. Um, so just having a shared language and knowing that other people are experiencing this feeling can be super powerful, but we can also use it in other ways, which we'll talk about in the future. Next slide. Eco anxiety is probably the term that a lot of people are familiar with. It comes up a lot in the media. Um, it refers to those heightened emotional, mental, or somatic distresses that we experience in response to dangerous changes in the climate system. Um, and it's associated with, um, as all anxiety, with a forward fixation of one's future and future generations. We know that younger adults are more likely to experience this, um, and this impacts their academic abilities. It impacts um, how they're planning for the future, how they're spending, what kind of jobs they're taking. Um, so eco anxiety, again, is that forward fixation. So having difficulty staying in the present moment and seeing what can be done and being overwhelmed with emotions about the future. Next slide. Ecological grief is what I study. 
Um, it's the grief felt in relation to experience or anticipated ecological losses, including the loss of a species and ecosystem and meaningful landscapes due to acute or chronic environmental change. Ashley Consolo and Neville Ellis are two of the big researchers who study this um, in both agricultural and indigenous communities in the United States and in other cultures. There are a couple of different types of ecological grief. One is the physical loss. Um, so one example is I have a lot of older adults who will share with me um, feelings of grief around species they no longer see. Um, so lightning bugs or fireflies, depending on what part of the world you live in, bird species, a, la um, a lack of frogs, wetlands that have been dried up. Um, so those physical losses. Cultural losses refer to like a loss of a way of life. So when I mentioned mountaintop, uh, mountaintop removal in different communities in Appalachia, we know that foraging and other um, cultural practices have been lost due to damaged landscapes. And so feeling a loss of culture and that connection to your community. And then anticipatory losses is that feeling of grief you feel before something has happened. So if you've ever had a loved one in hospice or in the hospital and it's not looking good, you know that feeling of you're already mourning their loss before it's happened. Um, and that can kind of coincide with eco-anxiety. Next slide, please. So you might say, what is the point of looking at mental health and climate change or climate injustice? Um, we already have a great body of research on the physical health impacts and we know that they're interrelated. Um, what I would tell you is mental health matters. And if we can improve mental health and we can understand how to be mentally resilient in climate change, we're gonna do a better job protecting our planet and ourselves. One in five Americans experience mental illness in a given year. That means that there's a lot of decision makers in your community that have a connection and feel motivated to act for mental well being. So, if we're able to measure and talk about the mental health impact of plastics and climate injustice, that's going to strengthen our advocacy and how we can show up to have conversations with our community members. Having a shared language creates the ability to study, measure, create um, new solutions, and connect. I know that it's hard to feel like you're the only one. It's hard not to have words to put to an experience you're having. Um, there's a lot of great books. There's a lot of support groups. There's a lot of community dialogues happening around um, mental health and climate change. And so tapping into those could be a body of um, support and connection that can help you in doing your advocacy and making changes in your life. Um, and we also know that money talks. Mental illness is incredibly expensive <laughs> to your community and to yourself. Um, the more mentally healthy we are, the more financially healthy we'll be as communities. A lot of cities are taking climate action to save costs for their community members and their taxpayers. Um, so if you can loop in that there's also a mental health cost to your advocacy, um, in addition to the physical health um, and then the infrastructure cost, you've got a really strong case for your community to take action. So to close us out, um, again, this is all invitational. If you want to take a moment to put your feet on the ground, feel connected to something underneath you, whether that's the floor, your carpet, the seat that you're on. It's hard to hear all the big scary things happening to our communities that are happening in our own bodies. Um, it's hard to see vulnerable people that we love experience the hardest burdens of the plastic industry and climate injustice. Just know that there's a lot of resources if you're feeling overwhelmed or frustrated and that um, I would be happy to have anyone reach out to me and I can connect you with support groups, therapists, literature, um, whatever you need to stay mentally healthy while you're doing this important work. Thank you very, very much, Bailey. I know I, um... I connected with a lot of the things that you were saying because I've done this work for a very long time. And I think most of the people here also, I hear there's a lot that we haven't lost yet. And the things that I really enjoy going out and watching the deer and listening to the birds in the morning with my coffee and that the anticipatory part of that is very real. 
So thank you very much. And I commend you for doing this. Um, and uh, you never know, you, I may reach out. But I do know that um, Randy's one of my friends. She's one of my support systems. You know, we'll just get on the phone and we'll just start talking and it really does help. So appreciate you very much. We will be taking questions after our last person presenting. And her name is Rachel Meyer. She lives in the Ohio Valley. Uh, she's a field coordinator for Moms Clean, Clean Air Force. After moving to Pennsylvania Township, that's riddled with oil and gas infrastructure, Rachel began researching and collaborating with nonprofits to organize locally and spread the word about the harmful effects of the industry and the need for protections and alternatives. Rachel believes everyone deserves a future with healthy and sustainable jobs and with an end to the unacceptable pollution that has negatively impacted residents' health for decades. She is particularly concerned with the threat of the petrochemical buildout as companies use the region's natural gas for the manufacturing of goods such as plastics. As an educator with a master's in environmental education and a mom, Rachel cares greatly about the health of our children and is dedicated to work that repairs our relationship with the natural world so that they can, so that they, her children and all children may have a better future. Thank you very much, please. Take the mic. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Rachel Meyer, and I'm, I work with Moms Clean Air Force. Moms Clean Air Force is a community of over a million moms and dads that are united against air pollution, including the urgent crisis of our changing climate to protect our children's health. Next slide, please. I live in Independence Township in Beaver County, which is in southwestern Pennsylvania. My home is now surrounded by a web of oil and gas infrastructure, including many wells, pipelines, pigging operations, a compressor that moves gas um, through pipelines, truck traffic, um, storage tanks for toxic wastewater, and now add the petrochemical build out to the mix. You can see um, in the picture there, of my daughter, the shells at the cracker plant, which you've heard about from other presenters. Um, that plant is for making plastic. That's what's behind us. Um, children like my three-year-old daughter are especially at risk because their little bodies are still developing and pollution exposures can have immediate and long lasting effects for them. Next slide, please. So children are more vulnerable to air pollution. Um, you can see some reasons there. They have a higher respiratory rate. Um, they don't clear toxins from their bodies as efficiently as adults and their brain and lungs are still developing. Um, it's every adult's responsibility to protect children in the community. Next slide, please. I'd, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the oil and gas infrastructure in my community and its impacts on health, both mental and physical. Can you see the natural gas compressor, compressor in the picture? It's a picture I took about a mile from my, ho my house. As you can see, the trees and the topography here often make oil and gas operations difficult to find. Next slide. Because of Pennsylvania's rolling hills and vegetation, it's difficult to get good pictures of the oil and gas infrastructure around me, but here are some representations from Pennsylvania. Oil and gas operations emit climate warming methane pollution along with volatile organic compounds such as benzene that harm health. Harmful pollution is generated from gas wells being drilled and fracked to tanks on the well pad, to compressor stations that move the gas along the pipelines, to processing facilities. Next slide. This slide shows more of the gas infrastructure on my home. There's a lot of truck traffic needed to construct well pads, frack wells, and hollowway drill cuttings and toxic wastewater. After the fracturing phase, the wastewater has many chemicals, salts, heavy metals, and radioactivity, um, as we heard Randy talk about. This toxic cocktail is hauled away for disposal in injection wells or storage tanks. 
pig launchers are used for cleaning and inspecting the pipelines and when opened cause large releases of air pollution, primarily methane and VOCs, and pipelines can leak and explode. Next slide. So not only are there pollution risks to health, there are also safety risks due to explosions. In 2018, a house across the highway from where we live blew up. A deafening blast um, woke the community at 5 a.m., shaking houses. A ball of orange fire reached 150 feet into the air. Two dozen families had to flee from their homes. A landslide had caused the revolution transmission pipeline carrying fracked gas to explode. The blast destroyed a house, a barn, and some cars and collapsed six high voltage transmission towers. Thankfully, no people were hurt this time, but the explosion scorched the hillside and left a crater 25 feet deep and 30 feet across, and the pipeline was not even carrying its full capacity. The bottom picture here shows the revolution on my road. The road is in a valley, so there is a steep hillside on each side of where it goes under the road. The pipeline has been there for over five years, and the hillside is still constantly needing stabilization work. Obviously, this is a source of anxiety for my family and our neighbors. Next slide, please. The purple lines on this map represent the pipelines that run through my township, including the Revolution and the Falcon. The Falcon pipeline runs uh, from south to north and is in the middle right side of the township there on the map. It's the most squiggly purple line. The Falcon carries ethane to the cracker plant for making plastic. Next slide, please. And here are some photos from the construction of the Falcon pipeline through the Beaver County Conservation District, which is also not far from where I live. The hillside is next to the Environmental Education Center. School children take field trips here. You can see the covered over drained wetland with equipment on it. Beyond that is Raccoon Creek. They did horizontal directional drilling under the creek and spilled drilling fluid. This creek floods into a farm field directly across from where the spills happened. This farm has a popular market where they sell their produce to the community. It's also worth noting that Shell did not inform the farm about the spill. So this sort of lack of transparency causes further anxiety. Next slide, please. The ethane in the Falcon pipeline comes from fracking. Over the last decade, fracking has produced an abundance of fossil fuels and also cheap ethane, which is a feedstock for making plastics for the petrochemical industry. You can see on the slide the plastic cycle, um, which you can see is not like a natural cycle because there is virtually no reuse of materials, just more fracking. Not only am I concerned about the health and safety of my family from pipeline explosions and from all the oil and gas operations in my community, I also worry about all the pollution that will impact the region from the petrochemical buildout. Cracker plants spew large amounts of climate warming carbon dioxide and many health harming toxic chemicals such as benzene. Families living in nearby communities are at a higher risk of cancer and neurological problems, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, birth defects, and asthma attacks. Next slide, please. One of North America's largest petrochemical complexes located here in Beaver County um, is gearing up for operations. The ethane cracker facility is a sprawling 800 acres of towers, tanks, and pipelines big enough to cover 605 football fields. It's large enough and dangerous enough to, to require its own fire department. The Shell ethane cracker has already had at least two chemical spills and an equipment failure, failure that led to dark plumes of smoke. These accidents have happened before the facility has even officially gone into production. Concern is growing over the possibilities of future serious accidents. There will continue to be a need for more fracked gas wells, um, an estimated around 200 more a year to, the, to feed the plant ethane for making plastic. And there are projections of additional polluting plants along the river. Next slide, please. One of North America's largest petrochemical complexes. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> just read that. I am um, concerned as more infrastructure for a petrochemical hub is being built around, uh, around us and, and what that means for the Ohio River Valley region. 
we can look to other areas in the U.S. to see how the petrochemical industry has impacted local communities. Cancer Alley is the 85-mile stretch of the Mississippi River between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, packed with over 150 factories for petroleum refining or chemical production. The amount of toxic and hazardous wastes that are regularly released has overwhelmed the landscape and the people. The cancer rate along this chemical corridor is nearly 50 times the national average. In this area, there are many communities of color and low-income communities. Next slide, please. When the oil and gas or the petrochemical industry comes to town, it takes a toll on the community. Conflicts often arise between neighbors who want the industrial development and those who do not, and this strains relationships within communities. For those who do not want industry near them, these community conflicts can often lead to feelings of powerlessness, anger over site location, concerns about safety and security, and disillusionment with government over failing to protect them. Add on the growing body of scientific and medical evidence that associates petrochemical and oil and gas operations with negative health effects, and it is very understandable why impacted community members suffer from high levels of stress, anxiety, and depression. But there are ways to take action. Next slide, please. It is so important for people to speak up and take action. Um, here are some effective tools. Uh, I can't stress enough the importance of voting for candidates with your best interests in mind. Um, finding others in the community is really important for support. Um, joining organizations, there are great organizations like Climate Reality, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Moms Clean Air Force, and many others that can help with actions and education. And get educated. Moms Clean Air Force has some great fact sheets on many topics. I actually had dropped a link to those in the chat earlier. Um, we have climate change and mental health. We have um, petrochemicals in your health, um, chemical recycling, um, just information on cracker plants, lots of very user-friendly fact sheets, along with peti petitions. It's easy to sign a petition online to make your voice heard. And you can attend rallies, you can use social media to raise awareness of issues, tweet elected officials, engage lawmakers. It's so important for elected officials and agencies to hear from you and participate in public hearings. And I have more on that later. Next slide, please. I'm taking action. I've joined a community watchdog group called Eyes on Shell. And the organization encourages residents to work together to monitor the impacts of Shell, the Shell Ethane Cracker Facility on our air, water, light, and noise levels. The community is encouraged to report to the group and state regulatory agencies what we see, hear, smell, and feel, because it could help to alert the community to a health or safety problem. I will be holding the petrochemical industry accountable for our health and safety, especially for children who are vulnerable to pollution, like my three-year-old daughter. Next slide, please. I've met with congressional offices to talk about my concerns about pollution from oil and gas operations and the petrochemical industry. Most recently, I've been educating congressional members about advanced recycling, which is really plastic incineration. Advanced recycling is a term invented by the petrochemical industry in order to be able to greenwash the incineration of plastics. So it's very important to understand that this is not a solution for plastic pollution. It's just taking out pollution and putting it into the air that we breathe. Next slide, please. I'll end with an example of an upcoming action that you can take. We are anticipating that the Environmental Protection Agency will release a draft federal oil and gas methane rule any day now. This rulemaking would limit methane pollution along with the other harmful air pollutants to help protect public health and the climate. Once this draft methane rule is released, there will be a virtual public hearing uh, in a few weeks. You can sign up to give three to five minute testimony and let your voice be heard. Moms Clean Air Force has information we can share that will help with writing comments. For those that want a quicker way to give comments, we will have a petition you can sign online. So it's very simple. Next slide, please.
Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much. I know Mom's Clean Air Force is doing a lot of good work. Please look them up and we will be sharing these links and all of the resources that have been shared um, this evening. Um, yeah, I, I just wanna, again, thank everyone for being here. I wanna thank the presenters, you were clear and, um, and very informative. And again, I wanna apologize for not being ready when the, when the webinar started. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> so um, now I'm gonna turn it over to, I believe Peggy, and she's going to present the questions to our presenters. Thank you, Peggy. Yeah. I'm gonna work very hard at, at uh, creating that momentum. So first, and either Randy or Ned can, can uh, address this, what are the differences between carcinogens and mutagens? You can, you'll have to unmute yourself, Randy and Ned. Um, Randy, would you like me to start? Yeah, go ahead. So mutagens um, are substances or chemicals that um, cause mutations in the genes, uh, in the chromosomes. Uh, uh, carcinogens are chemicals that cause cancer. Uh, most um, cancers occur because of mutations in, um, in genes. Uh, those uh, mutations can be present from birth. Uh, those mutations can uh, occur later on in life, uh, but it doesn't mean that those mutations uh, will result in cancer. Uh, usually there is uh, another impact that occurs um, and that's where the environment really comes into play uh, and why we feel that so many cancers are actually preventable uh, is because something turns that cancer gene on, uh, the, the, uh, the gene that mutated either even in a past generation that you carry doesn't mean that you're going to get cancer, but there seems to be things in the environment. We know that there are things in the environment that seem to turn those genes on and then cancer is expressed. Okay, Randy, is there anything you want to add to it? Uh, the only thing I would say is uh, I think it's um, you know one of the situations as far as uh, beyond cancer is the uh, the ability of some of these compounds to affect uh, when we're going through secondary sex development to turn on and off processes. That is really scary to me. And they've even done studies in the womb. Uh, where they've taken um, mice that are pregnant and they can inject them with enough of these plasticizers that they could find out that the four males that they were carrying previous to the delivery would all become four females. Mm, wonderful. Okay, another question for you, Randy. Uh, one of the uh, uh, participants said that my, chemineer, uh, my chemical engineer husband says PET plastics are 100% recyclable. What are your thoughts? Okay, so that's, that's polyethylene to phthalate. Uh, it, it, I guess it uh, really, you know, what do you mean by recycling? Because I, I know plastics, they are telling us in peer review studies have shown that you can actually recycle them maybe twice or three times but what happens is the polymer itself degrades. So when you look at a plastic polymer, um, like when, they, when they're going to make these plastics at the cracker plant, they hook all these little monomer units. So they're hooking a lot of ethylene units together. So it looks like a train car. And then when the plastic is exposed to UV light and other um, environmental factors, those little train cars start to break apart. So the plastic itself starts to degrade and uh, you could probably recycle it once or twice. We have a deck that's made out of recycled plastic. It's, it's from a company called AZEC and it's completely solid plastic. It was hideously expensive, but it was, um, it was a pop bottles basically is what it's made out of. And so we felt like, you know, we were doing something at least keeping those out of the landfill, but you can't recycle plastic indefinitely. Like you can remelt aluminum over and over and over again because it's an element and it just melts into the aluminum atoms, but you can't do that with plastics. Yeah. So is it recyclable? Yeah, but is it endlessly recyclable? No. 
Okay, so even when it is getting recycled, there's a limit to that, the ability to recycle that plastic. Right, and you've got to watch too because it's like, you know, you know, going to the grocery store and seeing the various kinds of Campbell soup on the shelf, each plastic formulation is different. And even though it's just soup or it's just plastic, it's not the same and you can't mix them. And this is one of the things with the recycling uh, process itself, you know, even, especially in the United States, nobody pays attention to ones, twos, seven spot. They, they dump it all together, even though they're told that there's a difference, they still do that. And all it takes is one or two bottles, you know, something that's got PVC, which has got a chlorine atom in it, and it ruins that and it can't be used again for food sources. So we do know it can be recycled to picnic tables and decks and things like that, but you can never use it again to, to be in contact with food. Okay. Um, this question, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm an occupational health nurse, and so I wonder what are the decibels, Ned, around uh, fracking wells? Have you done measurements, and uh, how is it sustained? I mean, is it, you know, 24 hours a day? Yeah, there actually are studies looking at um, uh, at sound uh, and the measurements of sound around uh, uh, fracking operations. Uh, I, just for, I, from a practical standpoint, we have to remember that fracking is a process. It's, it's, it's not just one thing, it's many things. And it begins when land is cleared uh, by uh, heavy machinery, heavy diesel machinery. Uh, and then the, the well is constructed. And then you have the drilling, which requires the use of um, uh, of several, in fact, of, of many, and in some cases, uh, dozens of um, diesel turbines, diesel engines on the well pad um, to drill. Uh, and then you need even more diesel turbines uh, to create the pressure uh, that's big enough in order to frack a well. Uh, and this is this is and there's truck activity throughout the entire process. Uh, so people who live on uh, on roads where there's a lot of truck activity will tell you that it's just, you know, aside from the uh, pollution, the noise is just really loud. And you really don't get a, uh, uh, you know, a drop in the noise really until the well is completed and then production. But you still have trucks that come and go. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, there's always the risk that uh, there's more than one well on the pad. Uh, there are, there's a well pad near me that's been permitted for over 40 wells, oh. 40 gas wells on one pad. Uh, that's that's gonna be a nightmare for people living nearby as far as noise, as far as light, as far as smells, uh, and as far as the pollution. Okay. Um, now, I, I was gonna say, say a question about uh, EPA getting involved, and we know that uh, Rachel's gonna talk about how we can get those statements in. Um, so this is actually a, another question that came through on how many behavioral problems may be the result of exposure uh, to these chemicals. And maybe Bailey, this is a question for you. Yeah, Ned might also have some good insights as well. We haven't done a great job studying this. So most of the research is specifically around Superfund sites in the United States because that's federally um, identified locations. But we do see a high level of aggression, um, conflict, um, ir impulsive decision-making and behaviors like that associated with communities that are near highly um, toxic sites or by polluting parties. So I think it would have to look at you know, how close are you to a facility and what is the air quality or what are the chemicals you're exposed to? We definitely need more research on it. And I think that'd be something worth advocating for in your own communities. A lot of local universities are really interested in studying mental health and polluting parties. So it's something that it'll need citizen and neighborhood, you know, interest to show that there's commitment to the research and that we want to know more. But impulse decision-making, aggression, um, and difficulty communicating um, are some of the most common things we see um, resulting in conflict near toxic sites. Okay. Um, and can I just can I just add really quickly? 
that yes. you think about what makes uh, makes you cranky, right? Not getting enough sleep makes you cranky. And that sleep disruption is a big problem, especially for kids. Um, having a headache, I get cranky when I get a headache. Uh, and these chemicals really cause a lot of headaches. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it just go, goes down the line. All those symptoms that people get when you don't feel well, it affects your behavior, especially kids. Okay. Um, I, I know there's a, another question out there. Do you know if there are any links between autoimmune diseases like MS and plastic fossil fuel pollution? And I'll just open it up to our, our panelists here. Yes, Ned. Yeah, no, I was I was going to say I don't. Um, I think I don't know enough about it uh, to be able to answer that question. Uh, I would suspect uh, that there are uh, things that certainly in the environment that certainly can make the symptoms of MS worse and the course of MS worse. Um, I think, you know, exposure to pollution, exposure to PM 2.5 and uh, volatile organic compounds, uh, it's not going to help you get better uh, if you have a chronic uh, disease uh, like MS or any other disease. If you're stressed out, uh, if um, you're not sleeping, uh, if you're nauseous and you can't eat because of the pollution, that's not going to help you get better. So um, uh, as far as the, you know, the... Um, you know, developing MS, um, I, I don't know. Uh, I would suspect the environment may have an impact. Okay, and this one is for Rachel. What do your neighbors think about what's about to happen with the cracker plant operation? Are, are they even aware that there will be noticeable in, impacts starting day one? Well, I would say in general, um, there hasn't been a lot of concern. Um, a lot of the attitude is that we've been through so much, this couldn't be any worse. Um, you know, thinking of the pollution from the steel mills. Um, of course, with that, you could see it. With this, you won't be able to see it. I think Ned mentioned that. That's, that's really um, important because a lot of what I hear is indicating that people just think it's it's going to be fairly clean. There's not going to be a lot of dirty pollution. Um, there also was on that site, um, well, and, and one thing I'll say about that, of course, is that the particulate matter that is going to be coming from this cracker plant is small, which can be more harmful than the pollution, the particulate matter that you could see, such as from the steel mills. Um, it can get into your bloodstream and your lungs um, more easily because it is smaller. Um, People also will say, well, there was the zinc smelter there that was formerly at the site of the, the where the shell cracker is now, and it couldn't be any worse than that. But the reality with that is that there's um, going to be more potentially cancer causing VOCs, volatile organic compounds from the cracker plant than there were from the zinc smelter. So uh, I think that as people are learning more and there is actually more interest in learning more now, um, people are starting to, you know, there's a growing awareness and concern. Um, and a lot of this is, is starting to, um, to grow because as the plant is starting up, and going through its phase of testing, people can see that there's, you know, big flare lights lighting up their night sky, you know, even where I am, which I'm actually, as the crow flies, about eight miles from the cracker plant. But, you know, I can see sometimes at night, the flares, the light from the flares, people are seeing that people are seeing all of the, um, the um, smoke um, and steam and just realizing that this is, this is going to be putting a lot into our environment. Um, and so they have questions, you know, they're, they're not sure if it's really bad or not, but they see that it's, it, it's causing cha changes in our environment. So, so I'm hopeful that people will become um, more, more aware of what's actually happening and speak up about their concerns. You know, I really hope that everyone becomes more aware through the, the programs that we are putting on with tackling the A to Z's of plastics and fossil fuels. Um, and I know we have been keeping you all very long because you started at 530 with us as we were setting up it, and we are at the 740 mark. So I, I did want to try and, and leave at this point in time. Uh, 
to our participants, thank you so much for all of your questions. We will try to address those and we will also make sure you get whatever handouts our speakers would like us to hand out for you. And we will be posting this on um, Sierra Club Ohio uh, between the waters and tackling A to Z plastics and fossil fuels. I hope that you all will continue to join us as we address these really prickly issues that we are facing in this environment. And thank you. I hope you will start writing those letters to the editor and speaking to your congressman. Thank you. Goodbye. And thank you guys so much for everything today. I think I think it was a really good presentation.